Welcome to The Good Time Show. I'm your host, Damon Epps. Today, I'd like to introduce Dr. Clayton Marsh, the innovative mind behind Thaden School. Established in 2017, Thaden School has been a game changer in educational approaches right here in Northwest Arkansas. Their distinct programs like Meals, Reels, and Wheels integrate academic excellence with hands-on experience. The school's embrace of diversity and personalized learning, championed by the Walton Family Foundation, mirrors our community's dedication to progress and unity. Clayton, it is a pleasure to have you here on The Good Time Show. How is everything going? I'm doing great, Damon. I love it. I'm doing great. So I guess what I really want to dive into first, because I don't quite know what Thaden School is. In the most basic terms, it's an independent school now serving 325 students, grades 6 through 12. It's co-ed. It's a day school. It's non-sectarian independent school. What does that mean? It means we're not affiliated with particular faith practice. We're not uh, part of the district school system. We have independence, um, and we're guided by our mission. We have a board of directors, but I think one of the liberating aspects of the school is that we get to really design our own curriculum, our own courses, our own educational programs in a way that will advance our mission and aspiration. You are the founder of this school. Well, the Walton Family Foundation okay. um, recognized the need for an independent school, a, a new school in the region. It's it's not a model of education that is fully represented here in, in Arkansas or in Northwest Arkansas. Mm-hmm. So they, they did a feasibility study and they quickly established this would be a good option to bring to Northwest Arkansas. And so the next order of business was to find somebody to lead the founding of the school. So you just said that the board has a vision, or you said you have a vision, or the school has a vision. I may have screwed all that up. You said the board does not have a, a mission. mission. A mission. <laughs> it's a, a mission. Okay, a mission. Yeah. What are the type of kids that come to your school? So we are we are um, made of families from all over Northwest Arkansas, Benton and Washington County. In fact, I think of the 325 students at Thaden today, they come from 90 different schools. Um, wow. It's an incredible range. And, um, you know, at the core of our educational philosophy is this commitment to building a diverse school community, you know, that uh, the guiding principles beneath our, our mission statement, you know, foremost among them is this idea that the diversity of a school is essential to the quality of the education that it provides. And those are not just nice words. Those are not, that's not just a platitude. It's backed and resourced with a remarkably robust tuition assistance program. We call it index tuition. And this is entirely by virtue of the Walton Family Foundation. Um, They have given us the resources to make the school affordable to any family in Northwest Arkansas. My job was to cultivate interest, interest broadly and to help families from all walks of life see themselves in this school. And we have been so excited to see how many different kinds of families have stepped up to pursue a Thaden education. So when you walk onto our campus, you will meet kids of remarkable diversity and variety coming from far and near within the region who are all making the school stronger through their different life experiences, their perspectives, their backgrounds. That That is the secret ingredient in a Thaden education. These Waltons are pretty good people. Oh, my God. Their commitment to the school has uh, inspired me every step of the way. And and we've been through we've been through a pandemic. We've been through a startup phase. I mean, there's no end to the challenges you face as you're trying to establish a school. I will tell you that, um, you know, another cardinal virtue at our school is gratitude. And we are enormously grateful for the opportunity to establish a new and new kind of school, an independent school in Northwest Arkansas on a financial basis that makes it accessible to everyone. That's a remarkable gift. Um, There are very few, if any, schools in the United States that offer a comparable level of financial assistance, and that is entirely a gift from the Walton Family Foundation. And I have to say the Walton family's commitment to this this region is is why I'm here. 
But the Walton family has really just made this an incredible place to live. Yeah, well, I mean, as I said a moment ago when I came here, not really knowing what exactly uh, I was going to find when I saw Crystal Bridges, um, I said, what you can do with the support of this family is unbelievable. And we've been able to surpass really all of my highest hopes and aspirations for the school, you know, because of that, that philanthropy, that philanthropic spirit has carried us um, so far down this road toward creating a school that's um, like no other. You know, the vast majority of students in the region were in the district schools. Those are part of the, the state public education system. There were also a good number of small faith-based schools, but um, other than the new school in Fayetteville, um, which was, at the time was uh, educating pre-K through grade eight, um, there was not an independent school uh, here, certainly in Benton County. And um, they recognized that this was an educational option they needed to bring to Northwest Arkansas um, to give families another choice. And so with that, they went forward, ran the search, looked for a founding head who could then work with them to develop the mission, the vision, the program, everything. This was a complete and total Greenfield project. When I was hired, the school had no name. It had no campus, no faculty, no curriculum. Um, really just this basic idea that it would serve students from grades 6 through 12, that it would be located here in Bentonville, um, and that it would be a school that was academically ambitious for its students, um, one that would cultivate potential to a high level um, in order to put these kids in a position to have a broad field of opportunity after they left the school. That was basically... Sounds exciting yeah. and intense. It is. I mean, intimidating. Bill, it's a, a, on the exciting side of things. I mean, it's it's every educator's dream to have an opportunity to um, create a school from scratch. You know, um, to build a faculty, to build a curriculum. Um, that kind of opportunity has been for us compelling in our efforts to recruit faculty and administrative leadership to come to the area or who mm -hmm. are already here to come into the school. Um, and that sort of creative juice is, you know, um, still so alive at the school right now. And what's been incredibly exciting is to see how my colleagues have taken the broader vision and then run with it and have translated, uh, translated it into their classroom practice, into their course design, into all the different programs that we offer these students inside and outside of the classroom. And we've seen the kids run with that spirit. Um, Faden is a school where everyone uh, has a formative hand in the creation of the place, um, in the creation of what happens on campus, but also in the way we take our learning out into the community. And, um, you know, we've always um, seen that you get a really strong sense of belonging at a place that you have helped to make. And, okay. and we see that in our students, uh, in my colleagues on the faculty and staff and the families. There's this general um, kind of feeling of belonging that flows from the fact that we're all working together to create something. Um, so that's been one of the most exciting aspects of it. But you also said intimidating. <laughs> You know, building a school from scratch is a daunting process. Um, getting it to take root, getting it to bloom where it is planted. Right. Um, Seeing if the, the, the idea that you came up with is actually even a good idea. Exactly. And, and it was clear from the beginning that uh, the foundation what did, did not hire me to um, create a kind of uh, paint-by-number school or a school that, you know— was just a replica of something else. And, and it was clear from the beginning that uh, the foundation what did, did not hire me to um, create a kind of uh, paint-by-number school or a school that, you know, was just a replica of something else. They wanted, uh, I, you know, what I detected in 
in the foundation and, and in others very close to the project was a readiness to create something new and special uh, and, and dialed into this place. So I didn't come to the interview and say, you know, um, and they didn't ask, you know, what would the school have exactly? It was more, how would you go about creating it? How would you go about leading its, its, its founding? Understand. Now, had you not been to Bentonville before? I, uh, I grew up in Kansas City. Okay. Um, and from time to time as a kid, we'd come to northwest Arkansas to try our luck on the White River. So That's a lot of good stuff out here. A lot of fishing in our family. And those trips, for me, were hugely impactful and formative. We also fished the Kings quite a bit. Um, but it had been a long time since I had been uh, down here in northwest Arkansas. And Really, at the time, I wasn't looking to leave where, our, you know, my my old position. I was working at Princeton University as a dean and very focused on undergraduate uh, education. Um, but the phone rang out of the blue, and I will admit, I really was most interested in getting to see Crystal Bridges. <laughs> <laughs> And then I okay, so the phone the phone rings. <laughs> the, I'm assuming uh, it was yeah. Alice, one of Alice's team, or some, or the Walton Family Foundation it, team. It was a, a representative of the Walton Family Foundation. Okay, got it. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> what were you doing before this? Like, what, so you've been an educator. So I've ha I've had an interesting path through law and education. Okay, you know, I I for several years practiced law, commercial litigation in New York City at a at a large law firm. Um, I made the transition back to uh, higher ed by way of uh, work in the Office of General Counsel. And then when I was there at Princeton in that role, I began to shift and move over to the academic side of the administration. So my title at the time was Deputy Dean of the College. And the college is the, um, is the undergraduate academic unit uh, that, that thinks about how to guide students through their course of study that works with departments and faculty on the development of new courses, new majors, new programs. Um, it's all things academic life for the, for the undergraduate, uh, you know, freshman through senior year. Mm -hmm. um, so I had, in that space, I had had a lot of opportunities to be uh, closely involved in curricular innovation. Um, also a lot of initiatives having to do with, um, new programs and the development of new classroom practices. And, and so it was a very creative position to be in. Um, you know, it was one where we got to think about, you know, where is education going? What do students really need to be prepared for the 21st century? Um, so, uh, you know, of course there were the, the day-to-day -day trains you had to keep running, but it, it was a great, it was a great role to have at a very, exciting university, you know, with faculty who are um, enormously committed to their undergraduate teaching. So what was it like? So you get, so oh, you get called out here, the yeah. family says, or yeah. the Walter Family Foundation says, come check it out. We, we're interested in yeah. you helping run this new school that we don't even know what it is. We're just saying we want a school and you're going to come up with it. Um, tell me about what, what made you want to stay. You know, so over the course of three visits, we explored this possibility and got to know a lot more about the place and the opportunity. And, um, of course, it started at Crystal Bridges. Um, that was where the kind of uh, uh, welcoming dinner had been scheduled. And I, um, you know, immediately saw in Crystal Bridges a powerful demonstration of what's achievable when you have the support of this foundation. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that is a collection that really spoke to me as an Americanist. I mean, my particular area of interest is 19th century American literature, but also okay. painting and art. You know, I will never forget that night at Crystal Bridges. We had this wonderful dinner. We talked about fishing on the White River. We talked about all that was going on here locally with the, the culinary scene, the arrival of Brightwater. We talked about a number of other philanthropic initiatives. Um, and then this dramatic uh, April thunderstorm rolled in and we're sitting there in the in the in the um the great hall of crystal bridges you know it's almost like the ark with the the water flowing down over the glass the lightning is in the sky there's nowhere to go um and so one of our hosts just said well 
how would you like to just walk down through the gallery now a little bit? And it's, you know, it's dark out now and the lightning's flashing in the sky and we, we, uh, we start floating down, you know, the history of American painting and we come around one bend and there on the wall is Asher Duran's Kindred Spirits. And, and just so everybody knows out there in the world, um, Kindred Spirits is the painting that Alice Walton bought that started Crystal Bridges. The painting um, was put up for auction by the New York Public Library. They were deaccessioning the painting in order to raise Why would they do money. that? Why would you deaccession a painting? Well, I think they needed money. Oh, they needed money. It's and they weren't sure that the painting was core to its mission as a library. And, you know, it's a controversial subject, deaccessioning of collections. I mean, you, the donor, however the painting came to be in the collection, you know, can you part with it? Can you monetize it? And I'm sure they had a board that, you know, examined the question at great length and arrived at the conclusion that it would be in the best interest of the institution to put this painting up for, for auction. And there were those who felt, no, this painting really needs to stay in New York. You know, there's a little bit of controversy about it. It is a Hudson River School painting, sort of inspired by that school of painting in the in the upper Hudson River Valley outside of the city. I mean, it has a connection to New York. Um, and, you know, I believe that it was purchased anonymously, but then it became known that Alice had made the move for the painting, you know, and sort of... Uh, became the beginning of uh, of a larger public awareness that she was on the move building a collection. So impressed me a couple of things. First, that the painting was here in Northwest Arkansas. Second, that it had become the cornerstone of this amazing collection that was now drawing uh, visitors from all over the region and the country, um, that it was now back in circulation. Um, it was back in conversation with the world. It was utterly lost when it was in that back room of the New York Public Library. No one was paying attention to it except, you know, grad students like me that stumbled upon it when they were, you know, on coffee break. Right. Um, between mining uh, material for their dissertation. I mean, it was, um, it was astonishing to see it there on the, on the wall in Crystal Bridges. And it looked so at home in the collection. And... Uh, you know, I try not to engage in magical thinking, but that was a moment for me when I saw that painting so at home on that wall in Crystal Bridges. And for for people from the region, it could be Hawksbill Crag that Bryant and Cole are standing on as they look into the future of American art. I mean, that is a painting that, while it has a connection to New York, is really a painting about America. Mm -hmm. And to see it planted and now blooming before a new audience here uh, in Arkansas was to me inspiration for what um, I was now contemplating as the founder of a school. You know, I mean, Cole and Bryant are standing on this kind of rock ledge. I'm just going to be. I'm just going to go ahead and say it. Who is Cole and Bryant? Oh, they're the two figures. I mean, figure those two figures, but who are? Oh, well, okay. so the title of the painting is Kindred Spirits. Yes. And so the question is, well, who are the kindred spirits exactly? Well, literally in the painting, they're the two gentlemen standing on that ledge looking out into the valley. And one is Cole, the great American landscape painter from the Hudson River School. Okay, got it. And then um, the other is Bryant, the American poet. Okay. Okay, so Asher Durand is painting – a great literary and a great painter, a great liter you know, the great poet and the great painter together looking into the valley. And so it's a painting about American art. And America was still finding itself as a font of artistic uh, expression, you know, and especially at this point. I mean, you have so much now uh, happening in the artistic scene in America in the 1850s. It's really starting to get a sense of its own mm -hmm. potential. So um, so the kindred spirits could be poetry and painting, but it could also be art and nature because they're standing before the sublime landscape. Um, and, and it speaks a lot 
uh, has a lot to say about the relationship between art and the natural world uh, in America. Um, but there's so many other kindred spirits. You know, it, it's a line from a poem by Keats, and um, it has much to say about solitude, which is very different than loneliness. It has a lot to say about um, the place of art in the building of community here in Northwest Arkansas. It, 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 and it really is in many ways kind of a metaphor for what the school um, is meant to be, which is a, is a platform or a kind of premonitory for um, exploration of human potential. You know, I mean, that's the school is a, is a platform or a springboard for opportunity in so, and that will carry students in so many, so many different directions. We're also very always thinking about the relationship across different disciplines. So anyway, I could go on and on about that painting, but um, suffice but that, but that, it to say, just seeing it there, you know, literally raised the hair, you know. I mean, I I was I was all in at that moment. No, you d <laughs> couldn't let him know that because you were still negotiating your pay. Yeah. But we were we were figuring out. So you obviously have a deep passion for, I guess, where things are and where things are to go, and the vision of where America is. So now you've you've taxed yourself with a pretty big vision plan for this school. I first, uh, you know, wanted to really get to know the place and see the possibilities that were here. I mean, Crystal Bridges is obviously a great mm -hmm. educational resource, but I wanted to go well beyond that and think about what was here that could be used as um, material for the creation of a really exciting educational program in school and began to just spend a lot of time um, driving out to War Eagle Mill, looking at these bike trails that we're beginning now to come into focus, thinking about the history of food, the history of agriculture, the streams, the, everything here. And, um, you know, nobody said I needed to make the bike central to this school, but I couldn't help but notice that there was something interesting going on with all of that and began to think about the bicycle as a medium for education. I mean, there's great questions of design and physics and mathematics and the movement and motion of a bicycle. Um, so I just kind of held that idea, um, kind of put it up there for, you know, reflection. I then began to think about food here and what was going on. I knew that there was bright water in the making. Um, and food is such a powerful medium for education. I mean, there's just a world of learning in the, in the plate, you know, the curriculum of the plate. There's politics, economics, culture, uh, life sciences, sustainability. Um, I began to kind of think about all the different things that we're cooking here regionally. Uh, it's a great medium for studying culture. And then I um, thought about uh, pictures, uh, obviously, Crystal Bridges is a world of visual art and visual media, but mm -hmm. I began to think about the Bentonville Film Festival. And really, I just understood that we were all now becoming incredibly active consumers and producers of, of visual media. Just getting the lay of the land and thinking about everything that was here and um, found myself one day uh, enjoying uh, War Eagle Grits. Over a 21C. Okay. I've not had the War Eagle, War Eagle Grits. Yeah, War okay. Eagle Mill. Okay. And these were these were grits, and I had really developed quite a taste for these grits, you know. Now i got to try them. Are they still there? My early, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, they All have right. fantastic grits it's okay. at the high. My mom loves grits. And Great I'm Texans. like, War Eagle Mill, that sounds local. And I found out that, you know, the one of the oldest grist mills west of the Mississippi was still in operation, still powered by water over uh, toward Beaver Lake. Crazy. So I drove out there. So it's a mill that's actually still, still like yep, running on away. water. Yep, exactly. Wow, that's amazing. And um, drove across this little kind of, you know, uh, rustic bridge. It wasn't a covered bridge, but it had kind of the old wood boards across it and kind of rumble as you drove mm -hmm. in and parked some little kid is fishing in the paddle wheel in the tail waters of the paddle wheel by this mill, you know, fishing for perch or something. And uh, this is another moment, right? Like, <laughs> like the kindred spirits. And I walk into it. It's this kind of gambrel style mill. It looks like a little red barn, mm -hmm. two or three, two or three stories maybe. And um, walked in, 
and I, I felt like I had just, uh, you know, entered in another world. The, 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 the millworks were humming along, lots of wheels and pulleys and belts driving um, this mill that was pounding out cornmeal, and it was just piling up on the floor. And um, very melodic, you know, just, just kind of – because the, the place was filled with sacks of meal, cornmeal, other kinds of flour, stuff like that. And it kind of encased it, you know. It's almost like you were cocooned in there with these millworks humming around you. And this, this flour, this cornmeal pouring out onto the floor. And I took out my phone to start filming it, you know. Um, and then I go – here it is. These are going to be three signature programs for the school. Wheels, meals, and reels. And uh, that that was the beginning of one of the kind of defining features of our curriculum at the oh, school. That's really funny. So the meals is like you're going to focus on food and culinary food, food arts. Food cycles. And food they're all office. cycles. You know, right. the, the, food, the cycle of production and consumption and composting of food. Um, Got it. And, and then there's how the, like how the food is made. It's, you know, and then how the different way, and then that goes into that mill, especially it has to deal with energy. Completely. And then, yeah. and then fishing is sustainability. Power, and, energy and, and reels is, you know, of course a reference to film, but you know, the back of my mind, I'm thinking about fishing as well. Right. And then, and then the, so, so what has happened now at Thaden is we have these three signature programs that, connect all these different areas of learning. So, you know, the wheels program, through that, students use the bicycle as a medium for thinking about urban planning, sustainability, uh, design, um, mechanics, engineering, even physics, uh, all through the motion and movement of a bicycle as they learn how to take it apart and put it together and think about its place in the life, in their life and in the life of the community. Meals, again, growing food, making it, preparing it, um, uh, you know, as a, as a medium for thinking about economics, uh, culture, life sciences, sustainability, environment. And then, and then Reels is all about pictures in motion and narrative, telling stories um, through film and other kinds of digital media. And we have, you know, spaces now on this campus that support those programs specifically, but we had to incubate them. And these are not, I mean, these are just kind of connective tissues in a much larger curriculum that has, you know, robust course of study in mathematics or in uh, life sciences or history, English, um, uh, art, theater. You know, we have a curriculum that you know, it's very balanced and broad, um, but activated in some really interesting ways by these three programs that were sp meant to also connect the school to this place and to have strong orientation toward the larger community. So a lot of these classes are classes that are developed uh, in partnership or through partnership with, with local organizations or um, – subject matter experts in the community. And that's been the really, uh, that's been one of the most exciting things to watch is how our faculty have built these broader relationships and have kind of taken the school and, and I mean, woven it into the yeah. fabric of Northwest Arkansas. Yeah, there's so many fascinating people here. In fact, I know that you're the guy that runs your little film division over there. Corey. Corey. Yeah. He's no slouch. He is not a slouch. Like the guy's produced quite a few movies. He's done very well as a producer. He, <laughs> Corey is amazing. He is um, one of the most resourceful people I've ever met. Um, I mean, he just knows how to get stuff done and how to make a lot with very little. Um, what he did to um, build out uh, the soundstage and some of the other film production areas on our campus. I mean, he just went to work and found people to donate equipment, um, just a lot. You know, he put it, he put that program together with chewing gum and bailing wire. I mean, he, he had some resources, but boy, did he take them and multiply them dramatically. What would the grades are sixth grade to 12? What, no, what's what the grades for? Six through 12. Six through 12. Yeah. So, so we call the middle school is grades six, seven, and eight. And upper school division is 9 through 12. But it's one school. 
and all these kids are on campus together at the same time in roughly the same place. You know, we have little neighborhoods in certain wings of the buildings. What are you most excited that you're working on right now? Very excited right now to get uh, uh, create a home for our athletics and wellness program. Okay. You haven't had an athletic program yet. We've had one, but we've been incubating it. Um, you know, the school started in trailers. So, you know, we went through this kind of conceptual phase of developing the vision and mission for the school. Then, then I went to work kind of hiring um, the key members of that founding leadership team. And then we hired some more faculty and started to scale the school up. But it opened – in the fall of 2017, we're entering our seventh year this year. But in the fall of 2017, we started in portable trailers with 48 kids in just two grades, seven and nine. And then we doubled, and we were then seven, eight, nine, and 10, still in trailers. And then we transitioned over to our first permanent buildings in year three, got a couple more in year four. You know, and so we have just been growing incrementally year by year by year. And this year, our seventh year, we will graduate our uh, fourth class. And the last of the students who started in those portable trailers, we call them the trailer kids. That's and right. they they're they are the it rings know, home here in they're the original barnstormers, you know, these kids. And um so it's just kind of a um, exciting year for us in that regard. So I would say I'm very excited just about the whole year because, you know, it really is a, a, a special kind of the end of a special chapter in our founding as the last of those trailer kids um, graduate. But there's quite a bit of interest in athletics at the school, always has been, but we were able to incubate those programs um, first in a gym in a church off the town square here. Um, now we're out at a rented space um, called AAO and Rogers. And it gets old having to, you know, schlep back and forth um, to Rogers for your basketball practice or your volleyball practice. And it's it's high time that we build on our campus a, a home for barnstormer athletics and, and wellness. Are you guys so, going to have football? and? It's not in the cards at the moment. Okay, good. You know, I never say never. Yeah. But, uh, you know, we're small school still. Um, the kid, we've, we, there's a high degree of student agency in the school. I mean, we really try to respond to their interests and their needs. And What's the um, number one sport that you're going kind to of focus on? Biking, obviously. Well, or? obviously biking is huge. I think we have, you know, 70 kids okay. doing NICA this fall or something okay. like that. I mean, crazy number out of a school of 320, you know. Um, don't quote me on that number, but it, it's it's multitudes. Right, of course. Um, and some very, some very, very good. strong yeah, riders. It's crazy. But we, we it's, there's a lot of on-ramps to this sport. I mean, you don't, you got to give people a lot of grace getting comfortable on that bike, and we don't want to just sort of say, no, this is only for the high-powered elite riders. I mean, cycling is a, is a way of life, and we yeah. want all these kids to be able to have a healthy relationship with that machine. Um, but I would say, you know, basketball has seen high numbers. Okay. Um, we have a great new soccer coach in John Marshall who's now drawing lots of kids. There's always this kind of Pied Piper effect, you know, and everybody loves Coach Marshall, and now he's got a lot of kids to work with. It. That's good. You know, so um, – a lot of track too, and cross country's growing. Um, it's you know I would say seventy percent of our students are on one team or another. You obviously brought you obviously designed the school because there was a problem with other types of education, or do you do you see problems in? Well, does I, that is I, it you don't want to go down that path or? Well, no, I'm 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 you know the I I have great. Um, respect for other schools and other options. Um, but this is not, education is not a one size fits all world. Right. And I was a special ed kid, so I can tell you that for sure. And they would, you know, there was, you, you know, it. when I was really, really, I always say this, like, I don't know what I did in third grade where they said, you need to be in special ed. I mean, I don't know if I was handing out the wrong crayons to the wrong kids or 
But like, I don't know what what it made them to put me into a school, except for that I was hyper and I talked a lot and all that kind of stuff. And um, and I do think that you know there were if there were different types of schooling and different types of teacher teaching different things, I would have had no problems. Yeah. I um, mean, if you have, if you you know, if, if you're a hammer, all the world's a nail. You know. Um, I mean, we really work with our faculty um, on teaching to a differentiated classroom. You know, where kids are. Um, learning in lots of different ways. And you can do that in a smaller classroom environment. I mean, our classes are very interactive. Um, section sizes are small enough so that faculty can be improvisational and responsive mm -hmm. to meet the kids where they are. Um, and that's a luxury that requires resources. You know, you can't have, you can't teach that way in a large classroom with 35 kids. Um, but I've I've always you know felt that the district schools here um, are doing excellent work and meeting the needs of many families very very well and you know one of the first people that I, I wanted to meet when I came here on that April 2015 trip was the superintendent of the district schools Mike Poor okay. at that time and he could not have been more welcoming more engaging um, he didn't see Thaden as a as a right. in, invasion of any sort, he said, is, "This is just another option for the region. You know, we're better for it. Um, you know, let me know how I can help you." And and I should say, Debbie Jones has also been supportive, and we've partnered at key moments on key things. Um, but Thayden's not here to, you know, ch change things, uh, change the education. I didn't know system. if he, yeah, to, yeah. So to me, I just I didn't know if like. Yeah. If this is a good blueprint for maybe like yeah. for how to teach, how other yeah. schools could start teaching yeah. other kids. Well, you know, I think, I mean, a hallmark of independent school education nationwide, right, is focus on smaller class sizes, uh, focus on meeting students where they are. Um, I mean, you know, and it varies, uh, but lots of feedback, um, Lots of parent engagement. Um, I mean, those are those are by no means something that we've you know invented at Thaden School. Those are those are qualities and characteristics of many many schools and predominantly independent schools where they have the flexibility um, to design curriculum and uh, build programs that are really responsive to the needs of their of their students and their families, and responsive to the talents and curiosity and excitement of the faculty. Um, we do not prescribe, you know, what a teacher needs to be teaching exactly in an American literature course, you know, or, um, you know, a world history course. Um, they have considerable latitude in figuring out you know, what are going to be the essential materials? What are going to be the essential texts? What are going to be the main essential questions that we want these students to investigate during the course of their time? You know, um, it, that's the key. Um, it's giving your faculty that kind of, of latitude and, and um, agency in the, in the making of the educational experience for their students. And then they are charged up, excited. They have a sense of ownership uh, in the process. So that's, that's one of the key qualities that I, I, I would say of, of many, if not all, most independent schools nationwide is that kind of high degree of faculty agency and autonomy. Yeah, it's, it's hard right now with financing and all the things yeah. people deal with in communities and communities. Yeah, and, they, and, and people are starting to get very prescriptive about curriculum, you know. I don't want this in, but that, you know, this thing in – the minute you you take that away from faculty and you start directing them to teach one thing or right another. because they're all different people too their knowledge is different yeah. if you tell them they have to yeah that's a, that's a really interesting way of looking at that I didn't think about that that like okay yeah if you teach someone may be able to teach the same subject but if you're saying you have to teach it like this they're not going to teach it as well because they've learned it a different way or the way their brain works is completely different or how they would express that is completely different yeah. It takes the creativity out of it to some extent. Because that is really the big leaner. Uh, that what You guys really lean into creativity. I know that you guys are an out-of-the-box school. 
um, when it comes to creativity. Um, are you excited about what these kids are starting to, like, you created this. You didn't know how the kids were going to respond. What You obviously love these kids. Yeah. What do you do? You get excited about like, there's so many people that worry about these kids nowadays and how they're going to be and what they're going to do for the future. I always think that people are going to. It's like we are. Like, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's it's a scary. It's a scary moment right now. I mean, there's uh, we're still living with the effects of the pandemic. There's uh, our world is just saturated with social media to a degree that is becoming unhealthy. Um, we have, you know, environmental issues that weigh heavily on the hearts and minds of everyone, but the kids in particular, thinking about the future of this planet. Um, Thaden is a place where um, the kids can kind of nourish their souls. Um, I like that. You know, by by working with their hands, you know, thinking with their hands, taking things apart, um, by moving around um, a campus that um, excites the mind and the heart, um, that invites reflection, that uh, gets them to look at things from different angles. I mean, moving through our campus spaces is a powerful part of that education. Um, The sight lines across and within buildings, but also the landscape, an equally important player in terms of our campus uh, infrastructure. Um, It's a place where they can develop their powers of observation. They can feel the wind in their face when they stand in the breezeways. They can see the sun coming in through these clear story windows that Marlon Blackwell has designed in a a couple of our uh, classroom buildings. It's almost like you're, you're walking through a sundial um, during the day. Um, and then the, the landscape, you know, the, it's a habitat for learning. I mean, you, you, the, the, the sounds, the, the, the sights, the smells, the whole place kind of awakens the senses in, in ways that um, uh, promote learning and promote observation um, and that get you out of the screen, you know, these kids are not on their phones at school. Um, we do use classroom, you know, technology in the classroom, but very judiciously and in a way that's designed to tie into the learning of the moment. Um, but they have a, a very tangible, tactile uh, connection to that place when they're there. I think it's very healthy. And I, I have to say the food piece of it has been really important. We want them to really eat with their minds and break bread together. We have family style meals. Um, uh, they, we also want them to be adventurous, try new things. And, uh, um, they care, they really care about the place. So anyway, yeah, it's been amazing to watch them make it their own. What do you see yourself for the next few years? Or what, what are you excited about in your life? I am so excited to see the school really take off this year and for the next several years, and um, the school will never be finished. You know, it's a living thing. It doesn't look like a school, yeah. by the way. It doesn't, yeah, it, it doesn't it definitely, look like a school you know, at all. And there's many pathways into it um, and out of it. And we, the greatest objective for me is to make sure that we set this school up in a way that perpetuates its fundamental character. Um, and by that, I mean it's fundamental culture of curiosity, of creativity and invention. Um, it's profound sense of place. You know, they, there is a, um, a historical imagination at this school. Um, you know, we take the past and repurpose it uh, to make the future um, all of those architectural forms have analogs in the past, but they've just taken it and evolved it. You know, our, our school um, motto that the senior class, our first graduating class in 21, came up as Avalamus Unum, which means together we fly. But the key word is that evolve, you know, Avalamus, um, thinking of flying as evolving. And 
you know, the, the, the kind of connection to this place and to the past and thinking about how it relates to the future is a big part of the character of the school. The other essential um, quality is this high level of community engagement um, at the school. So many of our faculty and our students have taken their courses into, um, into the community in partnership with local organizations um, other kinds of stakeholders. They think uh, this school sees all of Northwest Arkansas and really the whole state as an extension of its classroom. It's not insular, it's not self-contained, and it's not at a remove from the community it serves. And of course, the number one priority is to make sure that we are putting the remarkable support of the foundation to its highest and best use in the form of this index tuition program. I haven't even mentioned that, but we'll go on into it. Thaden, I mean, historically many independent schools are seen as places that serve a very narrow slice of the community in which they they sit, you know, that only a few can afford to go to those schools. Often their architecture sort of signals a kind of uh, insular. We're talking like private schools. And, yeah. Yeah. Okay. You know, the classic private school yeah, yeah. with the big gate and the yeah. kids wear jackets that have a little coat of arms yeah. on it. And the competition's already built in because, you know, whether you like it or not, it's, you you're know, going to, you know, yeah, fill yeah. in the blank. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I, get and it. Uh, I mean, this is the anti school in that regard. This oh, that's is like, cool. This is like, um, Thaden is about access and opportunity, but. Um, you need uh, resources to bring the price of a Thetan education within reach for everyone. I mean, this is an in, this is an expensive school to run, and, and uh, you have to lower the barriers to entry economically with this index tuition program. So every family pays according to the resources that they have, um, and we have succeeded in attracting the school families from all walks of life, from all socioeconomic groups, who bring all very different perspectives, talents, skills, capabilities, and, and enrich the school immeasurably by virtue of the differences that they bring. You know, that's the together we fly, right? We're, we grow stronger together by virtue of our differences, cultural, socioeconomic, and otherwise. And the essential ingredient in a Thetan education is that, that diversity in our learning community. I talked about the mission statement a little bit, mm -hmm. but beneath it, we have all of these guiding principles. And foremost among them is the idea that the diversity of a school community is essential to the quality of the education. Um, and we, we are absolutely committed to this idea that classroom discussions, um, Learning inside and outside of the classroom is always going to be stronger and more dynamic if you have people bringing a lot of different perspectives to the table. And that's why we talk so much about balance at Thaden. Um, balance is not just a curricular matter in terms of giving equal emphasis to the sciences and humanities and everything in between, right? We have this very um, balanced kind of menu for the kids in terms of their course of study as they go through Thaden. Um, but balance is also goes to the heart of how the, the, the school community has been composed. You know, you want, um, you want all those different perspectives uh, in there. And balance is also a function of how you look at a question. Um, there's a great Einstein quotation. I couldn't believe it when I found it when I was thinking about the Wheels program. Okay, but he says when you're quoting Einstein. It's getting serious. <laughs> it's, it's getting... Einstein's yeah. brilliance is in his his simplicity and his ability to relate to, to the most basic things. And he said, you know, riding a bicycle is a metaphor for life. In order to keep your balance, you have to keep moving. And we all know that feeling of riding a bike, and you just got to kind of keep the pedal going or you'll fall over. So true. And it is absolutely one of the best metaphors for thinking at the school. When we talk about Thaden and a balanced and challenging education, a balanced education is one that teaches you how to ride around a question and, and look at it going. from all angles. 
iteratively, over and over, recursively, over and over and over, revolving and evolving as you look at it from every perspective. And that's why you need to have at the table conservative and liberal, um, every, every other kind of point of view, if you can get them, you know, at the table um, so that we're all informing each other's perspective. Um, that's and trying to figure out how to be part of community. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it, you know, we talk about empathy and belonging. It's ability to listen. You know, I mean, what we have a number of these kind of what we call community norms. You know, and one of the most important it holds the anchor position on this list of things. You know, speak from the eye perspective, encourage wild eye ideas. You know, there's a number of these. Um, the last one is listen, 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 and speak. And uh, listening is such an important ingredient in building community. Um, I mean, be interested. Don't be worried about being interesting. Be interested. And that's the kind of intellectual posture that we hope our students will carry into their, to their fate and experience and that we really cultivate. But I just, I just love that idea of riding around and around and around well, an idea. it makes sense that this is the biking capital of the world. Yeah. And that you have somehow made a curriculum around the idea that you yeah. need to yeah. stay balanced and keep it moving. Because yeah. I do believe that in a lot of ways, everything that I do in life, like I never, you know, working in a creative environment, you never know when the next thing's going to come, but you just have to keep creating and you keep creating. And somehow it just works out. You yeah. don't know how it works yeah. out. You don't know what's going to happen. You know, it's like this podcast. I have no idea why I, I'm doing it to meet people like you. And it's just been, you know, this is this is exactly what I thought it would be. Is I was going to learn from you about it, just an interesting path of why you created yeah. a school. Um, it's fascinating. Yeah. Well, you know, that idea of, um, you know, balance and motion being connected. In motion, you, you make your own luck, you know, you, uh, to some extent. I mean, sometimes you're just plain lucky. Yeah. And sometimes... <laughs> And I don't so ever, outside that best. Sometimes you're lucky, sometimes you're unlucky, and sometimes you're an even Steven kind of guy. But yes, but yes. You know, and and uh, but but you do put yourself in a in a position to have serendipitous um, encounters that can change the course of your journey dramatically mm -hmm. if you keep moving. Yep. You know, Hollywood um, is built on preparation for luck. Yeah. I mean, the I, whole the whole town. You could be the most brilliant actor in the world, and if you don't ever happen to be lucky enough to, and it, and it's it's a place yeah. where luck is very small and talent is very wide. Yeah. Um, that's why that town is so hard. You know, yeah. to, there's no reason why you couldn't be a famous actor. It's just you had to be right there at the right time with the right delivery and all that kind of stuff. You know, so. But I do think that that life's like that as well. Well, I know I know a a, a young man who was dealing with a very serious um, medical condition that made it un unbelievably uncomfortable to kind of go out socially, you know, and um, had every excuse in the world to just sit at home and say, I just don't want to have to talk about this. I don't want to have to, you know, just, I'm, a, and I'm just much more comfortable. Just, just leave me alone, you know? But did not take that approach and said, I got to get out there. I got to I gotta just be in conversation with people. And because of that, had this chance encounter with a person who introduced him to a doctor that was able to cure the issue. And Can I ask you what the issue is or are we going to keep it private? No, I'm going to keep it general. Okay, so fine. It That's great. Be. That's great. But it was by putting yourself out there, you know, created an opportunity to have a breakthrough, total breakthrough in addressing this medical condition that never would have happened. He had tried every doctor in the world, you know, and Just no by luck. chance. Just it's by just chance. by you know, being it's a, in the I mean, world, you run into anybody here because yeah. it's a small town yeah. and that's what's super exciting. But it really is funny. Even the world can be a very small place once you put yourself out there and really start. Yeah. Meeting so all the people. Yeah. You got to take chances, got to jump in. And that's kind of the spirit of the school in so many ways is, um, you know, the kids. This is what astonishes me is how we have been able to create an environment in which they feel safe taking chances, putting ideas out or running with an idea. And 
um, they, they, they really are able to stand and deliver in a variety of contexts where I, as a kid, I'd just be crawling under the table, you know? So um, that's, that's the other part of the culture that I hope we can perpetuate, you know, is because schools get, they're going to get bigger, they get older, you're always at risk of getting set in your ways. And so the biggest challenge is figuring out how to keep it fresh. And, uh, you know, we're, at the, we're entering our seventh year now. And, um, you know, I see it. I, I feel like we are, we're still completely fresh. Um, and I just want to make sure we never lose that. Well, I hope we can all stay fresh because that's kind of the whole key, right? That's why I love education. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. And um, it's been a pleasure. Thank and you. I really appreciate it. Yeah, enjoyed it. All right. Mutual. All right. Thanks. Have a good time, everybody. Okay. Well, that's our show. If you didn't get a chance to watch the episode, check it out on YouTube and Spotify. You can also listen to The Good Time Show on Apple Podcasts or any other platform. We are always trying to grow our Planet Good Times community, so subscribe and follow us at Good Times Us on almost all social media platforms. This episode was presented and recorded live at Blake Street House Sound Lounge in Bentonville, Arkansas, a social club where people from all walks of life come together just to be themselves and make the community a better place. Till next time, good times, everybody. Good times.